Our focus on our exposition this morning on the book of Romans is verses 19 to 23. But before we read the passage, let's join our hearts together. Let's pray for the Lord's blessing upon us as we consider his words. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. For we know that in your light alone can we see light. We thank you that you have richly provided not only for our physical needs, but even for our spiritual needs. For we know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. And we ask and pray now as we look into your word that you would give us light, that you would feed our souls. We pray for the ministry and activity of the Holy Spirit in our gatherings together. Lord, we know that we are not worthy to call upon you for help. We deserve nothing but judgment from you. But Lord, out of the richness of your grace, we pray that you would look upon us in mercy, in grace, and that you would hear our prayers. For this we pray, not on the basis of any righteousness of our own, but through the perfect righteousness of our Savior. Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. The gospel is not a luxury. It is an absolute necessity. All human beings are in need of the gospel. That gospel that reveals a divine righteousness that God has provided that divine righteousness that is ours, that we receive by faith and which God bestows upon those who have faith. It is not a luxury. It is an absolute necessity. And why? Why is it an absolute necessity? Why do all men need the gospel. Well, we have seen from Romans 1 verse 18. It is because of the wrath of God or the anger of God. God is angry with sinful humanity. The wrath of God is revealed or is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. People have the truth. And yet people suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And that is why all human beings are under the wrath of God. And that is why all human beings are in desperate need of the gospel. But one might object. But what about people who just do not know better? What about people who just lack the knowledge of who God really is and are worshipping and serving God according to the best of their knowledge? Why would God be angry at them? Why would they be under the wrath of God. Are they not worshiping God although they just are defective in terms of knowledge? They just lack knowledge? Why would God be angry at them? Why would God, why would they be under the wrath of God? Like the people who were G-strings who do not know better and yet worshiping God to the best of their ability according to the knowledge they have. Why would they be under the wrath of God? Why would they be in need of the gospel? Well, in a real sense, the Apostle Paul anticipates that question or objection and deals with it in Romans 1 
verses 19 to 23. And let's read a passage. In verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19, Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. In verse 18, we are told that men are truth suppressors. Now, what two things are implied by the fact that men are truth suppressed? Well, it implies that men do have the truth. How can you suppress something you do not have? It implies that men have the truth. They have a knowledge of the truth. Moreover, it implies that men who have the truth suppress the truth. They suppress that knowledge that they have of the truth. And that is how verses 19 to 23 of Romans 1 is structured. There are two sections in this passage and both are introduced with the connective in the original language Diothe, because, Diothe, verse 19, because that which is known about God. That's the Greek word there, Diothe. And then that same connective is used in verse 21, for, or better translated, because. In verse 20, Verses 19 to 20, you have many for, translated for, that's the Greek word gar. But there are only two times here in this passage that the connective deote is used. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident with them. For gar, God made it evident to them. 20, for gar, since the creation of the world. And then in verse 21, for, or better, because, Diote, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools. So notice the structure. The first section deals with the reality that men have the truth, verses 19 to 20. The second section, introduced by the Greek connective diote, deals with the reality that men suppress the truth. Verse 21, because even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Now, do you see the structure? In verse 18, men are described as those who suppress the truth. And that implies that they have the truth, they have a knowledge of the truth, and yet they suppress the truth. And that is how verses 19 to 23 is structured. Verses 19 to 20 deals with the reality that man have the truth. And then... Verses 21 to 23 deals with the reality that men suppress the truth. You see it? I hope you see it. So in opening up this passage, 
we will follow that basic structure. Men have the truth. People's knowledge of God. And then secondly, men suppress the truth. People's ignorance of God. Because men suppress the truth, they become in a sense ignorant of God. So in expounding the passage, we will look at each of this one at a time. So first, let us consider men have the truth, their knowledge of God. Verses 19 to 20. Let's read it again. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now Paul reveals seven things about the knowledge all men in general of the truth or their knowledge of God and for which they are accountable to God. This knowledge, remember, is the knowledge that all men who do not have the Bible, men in Islamic countries who never read the Bible, men who live in communist countries who may never have seen a Bible, men who live in remote jungles, who never set their eyes on the Bible and never heard of Abraham, Moses, or Jesus. What does Paul say about their knowledge, the truth that they have? Seven things. And here I'm following Waldron's outline in opening up this passage. First, the reality of this knowledge. The reality of this knowledge. Verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. Now two things in this clause asserts the reality of or assert the reality of man's knowledge of God. First, Paul mentions that which is known about God. Now there is a question as to whether Paul is referring to an actual knowledge of God, what they already know, or a potential knowledge of God, what they may know. Is Paul speaking about what men may know about God or what men actually do know? If you have the NIV, it follows the first. It translates the verse, what may be known about God. Or the RSV, what can be known about God. But the NASB deals with actual knowledge. What is known about God and the ASV. Also, actual knowledge. What? That which is known of God. Now, here, Greg Nichols commenting on this, he says, people debate whether to gnoston, what is known or what can be known, depicts what can be known of God or what is known of God. Either nuance is possible, but the choice is of little consequence exegetically. Because what can be known is known. And what is known can be known. Moreover, as Waldron points out, the 14 other occurrences of this word point strongly and conclusively in the direction that the word does not just mean potential knowledge, but actual knowledge. I can't give you all the references. If you want, you can ask me after the preaching what those texts are, but I will give them to you. Furthermore, the parallel statement in 
verse 21 indicates not just potential but actual knowledge. Look at verse 21. For even though they knew God. Not that they may know God. They knew God. It's actual knowledge. Therefore, Paul begins by asserting that man do know God. The knowledge people have of God is not just potential. It is actual. There are things that all men know about God. These truth suppressors do really have a knowledge of God. Then Paul goes on to say that what is known about God by these truth suppressors is evident within them or in them, verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them. Again, there is a question as to what the phrase within them mean. Does it mean inside them? That is, in their minds and hearts or in their midst, around them. In other words, is Paul referring to a subjective understanding or apprehension of God's revelation or is he referring only to the external revelation of God that surrounds all human beings? Either nuance is possible. Both thoughts, as we shall see, are present in verse 20. So it doesn't really matter exegetically. However, since the phrase, what is known about God, earlier speaks not just of potential, but actual knowledge, then that favors the translation within them. And you say, why are you getting into this? Because some of you have the NIV. And that's why I'm referring to this. Did you say, no, what about the NIV? It doesn't say that. Okay? That's why I'm dealing with this. I don't want to, but I have to. In case you have the NIV. Since the phrase, what is known about God is not speaking about potential knowledge, but actual knowledge, then we should favor the translation that which is known about God is evident within them. The knowledge men actually have of God is evident in them. This knowledge is plain. In their hearts, in their minds. It is not something out there to be searched for by man. In order that he will come to a knowledge. It is something men do possess in their minds and in their hearts. Deep within, they know God. So that's the reality of this knowledge. But then notice, secondly, the author of this knowledge. Where does this knowledge come from? Verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For, that's the Greek word, gar. God made it evident to them. Who is the author of this knowledge? All men have of God. God himself is the author. God is the one who took the initiative to reveal himself to man and to give man this knowledge of him. It is not something that man has come to possess because he sought after God. God is the author of this knowledge. Therefore, there is nothing that man can boast about concerning this knowledge. Whatever knowledge people have of God, the author of that knowledge is God himself. 
It's not that men in his genius wherever were able to discover who God is through his ingenuity. No. God made it evident to them. He is the author. And then notice thirdly under this first heading the duration of this knowledge. The duration. Verse 20. For, here's another guard, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power have been clearly seen. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world. Or from the creation of the world. Now, there is some discussion as to whether this phrase points to the source of man's knowledge of God or to the duration of man's knowledge. Did this knowledge come from God? Or did this knowledge begin from creation? Is Paul talking about man's knowledge of God that it is derived from creation? Or is it saying that man's knowledge of God had been a reality from the creation? The second choice is to be preferred because later in this verse foretells us the source of this knowledge. Look at verse 20. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, verse 20. Being understood through what has been made. So there he points us to the source. So here then, for since the creation of the world, Paul is asserting that men did not come to an actual knowledge of God sometime after creation. That God created man and man was not, had no knowledge of God and scratching his head, he was able to figure out after a hundred or five hundred years that God exists and who this God is. No, no. This knowledge people have of God begun from creation. It was not after men have lived a hundred years or five hundred years from creation did men come to possess the knowledge of God because by his own honest investigation he was able to discover after some time who God is. No. Paul says that the knowledge all men have of God began right from creation. Right from the very start, men already possess this knowledge of God. From the very first time Adam opened his eyes, he had this knowledge of God. From creation. And then notice, fourthly under this heading, the means or source of this knowledge. The means or source of this knowledge. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood. Now look at the next phrase. Through what has been made. Here, Paul explicitly states the means or source of this knowledge of God. Creation. Creation is the means of this knowledge of God. In other words, the source of this knowledge of God that all human beings have is not God's word. Not God's word revelation, but God's works reveals who God is. His creation through what has been made. Just as the works of Michelangelo reveal something of what he is like as a man, even so the works of God's creation reveal something of who God is and what God is like. What God is like. God's work of creation makes the invisible God 
visible. Through his works. And here, Paul could well have been thinking of Psalm 19. You remember Psalm 19? Where David celebrates the two channels of God's revelation. His works of creation and his word. He begins with the work of creation. In Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. And the response is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are they words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth. Their utterance to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chambers. Etc. So God's revelation of himself in his work of creation is continual. It is universal. Through the stars and particularly through the sun, God's glory is revealed through his works. And it is a continual revelation of God and it is a universal Revelation of God. Day, every day, and night and day. We see God's glory through his works of creation. And it is universal. It does not matter whether you speak English or Tagalog or Chinese or, Phil or Spanish or Urdu. This revelation is universal. Say, I can't read that revelation. It's in English. No, it's not. It's a universal language. Everybody see it. It is a universal revelation. And then notice. Fifthly, under this heading, the clarity of the source of this knowledge. The clarity of the source of this knowledge. Verse 20 of Romans 1. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, notice the next phrases, have been Clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. The verb have been clearly seen is a present indicative verb and points to the present and continuing perception of God's invisible attributes through his works of creation. And this verse is in the intensive form. And that's why all translations that I am familiar with translate it clearly seen or clearly perceived. Have been clearly seen. The participle, in other words, it is not something that is obscure. It is clearly perceived. And it is in the present, even after the fall. It is still clearly seen. And then the participle, being understood, linked with the dative by the things that are made, has the same effect. The impact of man's exposure to God's revelation in his works of creation is man's actual recognition of God's invisible attributes. Men do not only clearly see the invisible attributes of God through the works of God, but men do understand 
being clearly seen, have been clearly seen, and not only clearly seen, being understood. Men do know God because the source of this knowledge is so clear it is impossible to miss it. And it is so plain and simple everybody understands it. God's revelation in his works of creation is not in fine print. And it is not only for the intelligent and the wise that the less gifted in terms of intellectual prowess cannot understand. No! It is in bold red letters. And they are simple enough and clear enough that everybody do understand. You don't have to be a philosopher to be able to trace out the God through his works of creation, through a complex of logical arguments arriving at the existence of God and who this God is. No, no. It is clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. That is the means, the clarity of the source of this knowledge. And then notice under this heading, the content of this knowledge. What is included in this knowledge? Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature. Now here the phrase could be translated. His invisible attributes. Not only his eternal power. But also his divine nature. That's a perfect way to translate the language here. I will not go into the details of that. But that is a perfectly legitimate way of translating the phrase. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, not only his eternal power, but also his divine nature. Now the phrase, his eternal power, refers to one specific attribute of God. And the phrase, his divine nature refers to what John Morey calls as the sum of the invisible perfections which characterizes God. Not only his eternal power, his eternal power is part of his divine nature, but not only his eternal power is made visible in his works of creation, but also his Divine nature. In other words, it refers to the invisible perfections which makes God God. That is what is revealed to his works of creation. Now, Paul singles out one specific attribute of God, his eternal power. This power is not just power. It is eternal power. In other words, it is unoriginated and inexhaustible power. This invisible attribute of God is made visible in his works of creation. When you begin to understand the vastness of the universe, The burning stars. The energy that is packed in the universe. Then you begin to understand the, the eternal power 
of the God who made them. Now, why does Paul single out this divine attribute of eternal power? Well, the context is the key to the answer. Since men know God's eternal power through his works of creation, then men ought to respect and obey God. Men should do nothing that would provoke God. But sad to say that that is not when, what men do. They do not honor him as God, nor give thanks. They rebel against him. But in doing this, we must not think that it is because they do not know God's eternal power. They do. They are aware of God's awesome power and man's vulnerability to that power. And that is true even of prostitutes, hardened criminals in death row, the drug lords, the drug pushers, the adulterers, the murderers. They know God's power, but they still continue to do what they do. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That they are more afraid of imagined creatures, white lady, and can't sleep at night when they are alone because of imagined Draculas or whatever spirits. They are afraid of dogs, but people are not afraid of God. That they provoke him every day. So Paul singles it out. But man's knowledge of God is not only limited to his eternal power. But even more than that, they know God's divine nature. And this is what is even more surprising. God's eternal power is known and understood through what he has made. But man's knowledge of God goes beyond God's eternal power. They even know God's divine nature. That which makes God, God. And what would this include? It includes all the other invisible qualities of God that make God, God. It includes God's goodness. And yet men are not grateful. God's patience. God's truthfulness. God's faithfulness. God's justice. God's wisdom. God's presence. That it is everywhere. He is not limited by time. People know. That's the content of this knowledge. And then notice the result of this knowledge. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So that they are without excuse. If men know God, even without the Bible, if men even know God's eternal power, His goodness, His wisdom, His justice, His wrath, then what is the result of that knowledge? They are without excuse. And the word without excuse comes from two Greek words joined together and it really means no apologia, no defense. They have no rational defense 
for denying God, the true and the living God, they have no rational defense for not honoring God as God. They have no excuse. They are utterly inexcusable not to live in the light of what people know through God's work of creation. They are without excuse. In other words, they can say, well, if only I knew God, I would be afraid. If only I knew God, who He is, I will never worship this or that or this or that. I will never worship God in this way. If only I knew God better. No. Those are all smoke screens. Men know God. They are without excuse. What do people do with this knowledge of God through his works of creation? Well, that leads us now to the second section of the passage. We have already considered men have the truth, their knowledge of God. Let's consider, secondly, men suppress the truth, their ignorance of God. Because what they know about God, they suppress, that leads to their ignorance of God. And that is dealt with in Romans 1, 21 to 23. Having expounded the fact that men have the truth, now we move to the reality that men suppress the truth. And this reality that men suppress the truth makes them ignorant of God. And concerning this ignorance, Paul says six things. First, notice the starting point of this ignorance. Verse 21. A. The starting point of this ignorance. Verse 21. For even though... They knew God. That's the starting point of their ignorance. They know God. Now here, we are again reminded that all men, even those without the Bible, do know God. All men do not just potentially know God, they do actually know Him. It does not matter whether they are prostitutes or cannibals or hardened criminals or Whatever, they know God. That is the starting point of their ignorance of God. Their ignorance of God starts with their knowledge of God. Now, an objection may be raised here. You see, both in the NIV and the NASB, the participle know is translated in the past tense, even though they knew. Past present. Pass. Even elementary students know that. That's pass. In itself, that is not a bad translation. But it does raise a question that we must answer. Is Paul saying here that Paul in the, that people in the past did know God, perhaps right after the flood? But that is no longer true at the time Paul was writing this letter. That, that knowledge of God had been so buried through generations of ignorance that the people during the Roman Empire no longer know God? Is Paul saying that people have become so wicked and perverted through the generations of ignorance that they no longer know God? Well, if you look at the text, that can't be. Why? Well, because Paul has just said in verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood. That's a present reality. Not some past reality. People do have a knowledge of God and that as a result of that, people are without excuse. Even that generation 
when Paul wrote this letter, they were without excuse. So if verse 21 is to be interpreted as referring to a knowledge of God that people had in the past but which no longer is a reality in the present, how can they be without excuse? Oh, but my mother told me wrong things about God. I can't, I, how can you blame me? That's what my parents told me. And through the generations, that is what we have been told. How can we be judge? How can we be under God's wrath? If they do have an excuse, then it is not right for God to be angry at them. And if it is not right for God to be angry at them, then that means that they are not really in need of the gospel or of the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. In addition, that interpretation of verse 21 does not fit the succeeding context. For notice in Romans 1.30 how Paul later described these same men. Verse 30, slanderers. What's the next phrase? Let me hear it. Haters of God. They are haters of God. Paul describes the men during his generation as haters of God. How can they hate a God whom they do not know? The fact of the matter is that they still know him. You can't hate something or someone you do not know. The fact that these men during Paul's generation were haters of God implies that they still have a knowledge of God through his works of creation. And this is also buttressed by the statement in verse 32. Although they, what? No. Present or past? Present. They know the ordinance of God. Men still know God. In fact, they still know the just requirements of God. But in spite of that fact, they have become so perverted and twisted, they still have a knowledge of God. So why then did Paul use the ores participle in the Greek in verse 21? Translated, for even though they knew God. Why then? Well, Paul is simply pointing out the logical starting point of man's ignorance of God. And this is the position taken by the great commentator Lenski. Man's knowledge of God can become so twisted and perverted, but it can never be stamped out completely. In spite of man's ignorance of God, they still continue to know him. Their knowledge of God is the starting point of their ignorance of God. Okay? So that's the starting point of this ignorance. Their knowledge of God. But then notice, secondly, under this heading, the efficient cause of their ignorance. The efficient cause. Of their ignorance. Verse 21. Even though they knew God. What did they do with that knowledge? They did not honor him as God. Or give thanks. If men know God. Then what happened? Why do men have such foolish notions of God? Why are men virtually ignorant of God? Paul says that although they knew God or know God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. 
Foolish notions of God, which is nothing but ignorance of God, has its efficient cause, refusal to honor God and to give thanks to Him. You see, knowing God's eternal power and wisdom should have elicited in man's heart respect for God. His eternal power. Knowing God's goodness and kindness through God's works of creation and providence should have elicited in man's heart gratitude to God for the rain, for causing the plants to grow. But that is not man's response to this knowledge of God. So ignorance of God then is due in the first place to man's failure to properly respond to the knowledge they have of God. Instead of honoring God, they don't respect Him. Instead of giving thanks to God, they complain and are ungrateful so the problem or cause of man's ignorance of God is not God's revelation of who he is before or after the fall. It is not that God's revelation is not clear enough. It is not understandable. The root cause of man's ignorance of God is ethical. It is moral. It is moral. And the rest of the Bible confirms this. For example, in Psalm 10 verse 4. In Psalm 10 and verse 4. The wicked in haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. How does he describe these people who deny the existence of the only true and the living God? He describes them as wicked in his haughtiness. His arrogance of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are there is no God. Remember that the psalmist here is not necessarily talking about a theoretical atheist. Who deny the existence of God. He is talking about all the wicked. Even the wicked that are very religious. The fact that all their thoughts are there is no God indicates that they're always trying to convince themselves that the God they know does not exist. And why? Because they are wicked. The problem is moral. They are proud. And so they try repeatedly to convince themselves, there is no God, there is no God, there is no God. Why do they say that they are wicked? Psalm 14, verses 1 to 3. The fool has said in his heart, notice, not in his lips, because there are many who say, in their lips that God exists, but in their hearts they deny him. The fool has said in his heart. This is not a theoretical atheist. This is a practical atheist. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Fools do not necessarily say in their lips there is no God, but all fools have denied God's existence in their hearts. They are practical atheists. And this problem plagues all humanity and not just the open, verbal, theoretical atheists. And why does the fool try to deny the existence of the true and the living God. 
the context indicates that the problem is moral. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sense of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even. That's the efficient cause of their ignorance. Moral. They do not honor him as God or give thanks. And then notice, thirdly, under this heading, the instrumental means of their ignorance. Verse 21. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. And then notice what they did instead. But they became futile in their speculations. Futile in their speculations. When men refuse to honor God and give thanks to him, then they will have to come up with all sorts of reasonings and thoughts to justify their failure to do what they know they ought to be doing. They would have to come up with ideas and theories that could justify their refusal to do what they know they ought to be doing. It is like a man who no longer loves his wife. And has become unfaithful to her. That man, in order for him to live with himself and to live with others, he will have to come up with all sorts of reasons and justification for his unfaithfulness. How can he live with himself without his contrived justification for his failure to to his vow to be faithful to his wife. He has to come up with all sorts of reasoning and justification. Oh, but my wife is a bad wife. My wife no longer loves me. I was forced into this marriage. I was still too young. I did not really know her. And I was not really ready to make that big decision. Oh, but you made a vow to God. Or think of the prodigal son in Jesus' parable. He thought living in his dad's house was hell and he left. Only to realize later that there was no better place to live in than to live under the generosity of his father. And that is exactly what men do. In order for men to justify their refusal to honor God and to give thanks, they will come up with all sorts of thoughts or reasons and theories that would justify continuing their, in their failure to honor God and to give Man will come up with all sorts of theories about God, theories about man, theories about the world, theories about the universe that would justify continuing their refusal to honor God and give thanks. Thus Paul says, they have become futile in their speculation. Or as some translation render it, futile in their thoughts, futile in their reasonings. The word futile is only used once in the New Testament. Translated here in the NSB as futile. It's only used once. But one lexicon defines it as useless, worthless, nonsensical speculation or reasonings, or thoughts. The word is related to the idea of being laughable. 
laughable theories, laughable reasonings. And that is exactly what we find in the works even of the most brilliant but unbelieving philosophers. Their theories about life, the world, God, the universe are useless. I will never forget sitting in my philosophy class and the teach in college and the teacher telling us, how do you know that the chair really exists? What if there is no objective reality about the chair? It's only in your mind. Prove to me through your reasoning. Well, they say, I don't have to prove anything. I can pick up the chair and hit you with it and you tell me. It's useless. Why debate about the external reality of a chair? It's laughable. In the words of Sam Waldron, all intellectual systems grounded in refusal to ethically honor God can never attain True knowledge. And I notice, fourthly, under this heading, the resultant condition of their ignorance. The resultant condition of their ignorance. 21. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. And what's the result? And their foolish heart was darkened. Their foolish heart was darkened. Now what does that mean? Well, it cannot mean that men no longer have any knowledge of God. They still have some knowledge of God. We have already seen that. They are still haters of God. Verse 30. And they still know the just requirements of God. Verse 32, even though they know the ordinance of God. So what then does it mean that their foolish hearts were darkened? Well, what it means is that their hearts have become a labyrinth of confused and inconsistent thoughts and beliefs. This is illustrated in the case of idolatry. And I will never forget the incident, the fire that hit our neighborhood when we were still living in our Orlando. The blazing fire at night. Such a frightening sight. And one lady, our neighbor, who had an image of supposedly Mary, run into the house to get that image and to lift her up that image hoping that she can stop the fire. Girl, you're holding that idol in your hand. She can't even walk by herself. And when it was already too late, she packed it in her bag Right? I mean, as I've said here before, if you have a baby girl, if you have a baby sister playing dolls, pretending that the doll is alive, uh, you, you don't panic with that, right? Because you know she's just pretending. I don't cry. You're hungry. Here's milk. Well, you don't get panicked because you know the child knows. This is just a game. I'm just playing. When, when adults stand before an idol, which is really a doll, praying to it, thinking that it has power, it can hear. You panic. How can educated people do something so foolish? Or I'll never forget a cousin of mine who said, My philosophy in life is, if it feels good, do it. 
to justify her wicked lifestyle. I was almost tempted to just really hit her. And if she complains, why did you do that? If it feels good, do it. And there are men who condemn Christians for saying that homosexuality is wrong. That it is sinful. They says you should not judge homosexuals. Well, why do you judge us for judging homosexuals? Are you not judging Christians? You see, their own thinking becomes so inconsistent. The reasoning is foolish, useless. The foolish hearts were darkened. And I notice, fourthly, under this heading, the pretentious claims of their ignorance. The pretentious claims of their ignorance. 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Men's futile Thoughts or reasonings or speculations result in novel theories, ideas that are utterly stupid and foolish. But that is not how men think about it. That's not how they view it. They are proud of their supposed insights. They think that their intellectual systems, their human-made religions, their worldviews are brilliant and masterful. They think that they are really wise and they claim to be wise, but in reality, they have really become fools. And this is how Paul views even the most brilliant but unbelieving philosopher during and before his time. Their proud claims that they are wise are really empty. <laughs> And remember, Paul lived after the world has already seen some of the greatest philosophers. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. <coughs> and isn't that still true today? What about what people think of Freud's teaching and techniques 200 years from now? They would think that was really primitive. Laughable. What would people think of the theory of evolution in 100 years from now? People think it's an antiquated theory. That is almost laughable. In the beginning, to laugh now. The beginning to see the inconsistencies. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And then notice, finally, under this heading, the monstrous extent of their ignorance. Verse 23. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They exchange or substitute idols for God in their religion. Instead of worshipping the incorruptible God who reveals himself in his works of creation, sinful man worship the corruptible things made by God and God use in order to reveal himself. Man, birds, four-footed animals, crawling Instead of worshipping the creator, they worship the creature that reveals the glory of the God who made everything. They worship the creature. And that's not only what they do. They even do something worse. They do not only worship the creature, man, birds, animals. 
crawling creature. They do not only worship creation instead of the creator, but they even make replicas of these corruptible beings and worship and honor those replicas created by men. That's even worse. People do not just worship the stars. Worship Mary, a creature. They even make replicas and give honor to these idols. That should only be given to God. That's even worse. And Paul tells us here that false religions are the height and climax of man's ignorance of God. False religion are not the closest that men could get in their effort to know the true God. No, they are men's attempt to escape what they know about the true and the living. And this is true of men's philosophies. So are idolaters just people who are sincere but who do not know better? That they are trying to worship the true God in the best way they think according to their limited knowledge. No. My friend, no! And you better believe God's assessment of man rather than man who is a truth suppressor assess other men. God says, no, man is a truth suppressor. They know the truth, but they suppress it. And that is why they, like all, are under the wrath of God. That's why God is angry. Angry with sinful humanity. And because of that reality, all are in need of the gospel. That gospel is the only hope for man to be delivered from the wrath of God. Is God rightfully angry? Of course. And so sad because there are even men who used to be evangelicals. Who now say that, well, you know, the Hindus, according to the best of their knowledge, so they, they, there's, perhaps there's a back door and even there's one man who's supposedly to be reformed in his theology and yet is defective in his view of man that says that perhaps there's a back door for Hindus to escape the wrath of God without the gospel. Because if only they know better, And that's why people's approach to apologetics is it's, it's wrong. Because its doctrine of man is wrong. Even among reformed circles. Their doctrine of man is defective. Why is God angry with all humanity? Because all humanity are truth suppressors. They know the truth. And yet they suppress it. And that's why all are under the wrath of God. All are in need of the gospel. The gospel is man's only hope of being delivered from the wrath of God. Therefore, Christian, listen. We need 
to preach the gospel. We need. And when we preach it, make it clear to those who practice crass idolatry that their idolatry is inexcusable. They are under the wrath of God. They know the truth about God, but they suppress it in unrighteousness. They know God, and yet they are ignorant of God. And this ignorance is due to their suppression of the truth in unrighteousness. We have to make it clear to them in a firm and loving way that because of their truth suppression, they are under the wrath of God. We have to tell them lovingly, my friend, you are under the wrath of God. God is angry with you. And we have to tell them that God who is angry at them still loves them and is concerned for them that he offers them the gospel. That gospel that reveals a divine righteousness that they will receive through faith and will God will give to those who have faith so that they will be delivered from the wrath of God. They will become right with God. But we have to tell them they are under God's wrath. And yet God in mercy, in love, offers them a way of deliverance. This gospel is not a luxury. If you have the cure of cancer, and you say, I'm going not to tell people about it. I'm just to keep the knowledge to myself. What an outcry. What an unloving gesture. We are the only cure to the greatest problem of man. The wrath of God. Proclaim the gospel. Be eager to find opportunity. Don't be ashamed of it. That's foolish. And for some of you here who are not yet true Christians, you might not be practicing crass idolatry. You might not be worshipping idols. But you are still a truth suppressor. You know better. But because you love the way of unrighteousness, you suppress whatever knowledge you have of God. And God is angry at you. However, in mercy, he offers you the way of deliverance. Why will you despise it? Why will you add to your guilt by refusing God's offer of mercy? Believe in him. Embrace the offer of righteousness in the gospel. And you will have peace with God. You will be reconciled with God. And you will have all the blessings that God promised to those who are reconciled to him. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this clear description of man. And we thank you, Lord, for the clarity of it and pray that this would impel us who are believers to even see the absolute necessity of the gospel, to preach that gospel to all eagerly and under a sense of divine obligation to proclaim it. And for those who are not yet reconciled to you, Lord, remove the smoke screens, the lies, the speculations. 
may you show them the folly of all of these things. And may they receive the offer of your mercy in the gospel. Bless your word for these things we plead in Jesus' name. Amen.